Hello, I'm Pastor Chuck Seilstad, Senior Pastor of Center Points Christian Fellowship. I'm continuing with a series of teachings on the 1,000 year millennial period called the Millennium Studies. In my previous teaching, in the last couple of weeks, I've talked about the judgment and blessings that come on both the goat and the sheep nations of unbelievers. Now these Gentiles, besides Israel, which is the Jews and other tribes, who are saved, they will become Christians and survive the tribulation period they will be looked at differently than the ones that are the, the goat nations, which are the wicked that took the mark of the beast or did not um, uh, ask Christ to come into their heart. Now, during the 75 day period between the ending of the tribulation and the beginning of the millennium, the Gentiles who will be judged according to their stance before the king, both the, the wicked and of course, the uh, ones that are Christians. Now today, the teaching is on lesson six, and it's called the 75 day interval, part five. And we'll be looking at the resurrected saints of the millennium. And I, I want you to know that I'm gonna start off with explaining something. In the millennium, the people who survived the tribulation period, both the house of Israel and the Gentile Christians who were saved during the tribulation period are the ones who will live in the world in their earthly human bodies. No non-Christians will enter into the millennium. They will live longer because Christ is ruling and reigning over the earth for the 1,000 year period in the Messianic kingdom. Now let me make it clear. These are human bodies, not the raptured or resurrected glorified eternal bodies of the church and others that are resurrected. We will be studying these people in upcoming lessons, a little bit more about them. But I, I wanna let you know, in this lesson, I wanna to speak to the people uh, who will go into the millennium in the resurrected glorified bodies. They're separate. Remember, these are people that have already been resurrected. But let's start off by uh, understanding, by doing a brief examination of the resurrection, the first resurrection, to understand these individuals who will never see death again. So the first resurrection, the first resurrection involves the resurrection of believers only. The first resurrection is not a single event, but comes in stages in an orderly progression, according to 1 Corinthians 15, 20 through 23. It says, but in fact, Christ has been raised from the dead, the first fruits of those who have fallen asleep. For as by a man came death, by a man has come unto the, also the resurrection of the dead. For as in Adam all die, so also in Christ shall all be made alive, but each in his own order. Christ the first fruits, then as his coming, those who belong to Christ. So after declaring what a resurrection of the righteousness will occur, and, and it's gonna happen, uh, Paul states in verse 23 that I, that I just read, that the righteous will each be resurrected in his own order. Now the word translated as order is a military term used for a sequence of troops of soldiers marching into a progression or procession or in a battle. There is one division of troops followed by another uh, division of troops and so on. Now, the point is that the righteous will not all be resurrected at the same time, but rather in a definite sequential order. Now, let me make this clear. I'm not talking about multiple raptures. There is only one rapture, and that's the pre-tribulation rapture of the church. I'm talking here about the stages of the first resurrection. Now, this will make sense in just a moment as I go through it. The first resurrection includes the following five stages. Now remember, this is gonna be a brief over, uh, overview, and then I'm gonna take you more into the details of this. Now the first stage was the resurrection of Jesus. We see that in 1 Corinthians 15, 23. He is the first fruits of the first resurrection. The second stage of the, as the resurrection is the church saints at the rapture of the church, according to 1 Thessalonians 4, 16 through 17, prior to the tribulation. See, 1 Thessalonians 4.16 says, For the Lord himself will descend from heaven with a cry of command, with the voice of an archangel, and with the sound of the trumpet of God, and the dead in Christ will rise first. Then we who are alive, who are left, and will be caught up together with them in the clouds to meet the Lord in the air, so will we always be with the Lord. Now notice it says the dead in Christ, the ones who died since Christ's resurrection, and the ones who are alive and remain on the earth until the rapture occurs. The resurrection of the church happens at the time of the rapture. The third stage will be the resurrection of the two witnesses who were killed by the Antichrist in the middle of the tribulation. 
they are resurrected after three days of their dead bodies lying in the streets of Jerusalem until God resurrects them and they ascend into heaven while the whole world is watching. The fourth and fifth stages happen at the same time during the 75-day interval. The fourth stage will come to the saints of the Hebrew scriptures, in other words, the Old Testament saints, who Jesus took to heaven from paradise at his resurrection. Isaiah 26, 19 gives us a, a general statement of the fact that a resurrection will take place at some time. Now, I understand this, that, that this idea is controversial with some people. But the Bible really points this out because remember, the people that are, that are resurrected in the rapture are the church. The church, remember, they, they started after the resurrection of Jesus on the day of Pentecost, whereas, and then they, it, the church ends at, at the rapture. And that's when they're resurrected. But these are the Old Testament saints, all of those that died up to the point in time that Jesus was resurrected. Isaiah 26, 19 says, Your dead shall live, their bodies shall rise. You who dwell in the dust, awake and sing for joy, for your dew is a dew of light, and the earth will give birth to the dead. Now, a clear picture is found in Daniel 12, 2, and it says, The many of those who sleep in the dust of the earth shall awake, some to everlasting life, some to shame and everlasting contempt. Well, in context of Daniel 12, the prophet is speaking of events after the tribulation. Therefore, this is the time that the Old Testament saints will be resurrected into their new bodies. Now, of course, I've always been taught in the past that it was uh, they were resurrected uh, with their new bodies at the same time of the rapture. But remember, the rapture says the dead in Christ. So in, in further study and reading lots of different scholars talking about this, this makes perfect sense. So the verse draws a clear distinction between the resurrection of the righteous and the resurrection of the unrighteous. The resurrection of the righteous will happen during that 75 day period before the millennial period, but the unrighteous will not be resurrected until the time of the great white throne judgment. They are judged and then thrown in the lake of fire. Now, only the first group will be resurrected at that time in order to partake of the blessing of the millennial kingdom. The other people mentioned in, in Daniel 12:2. They'll have to wait for that great white throne judgment. Now, many biblical scholars agree that the Old Testament saints that are now in heaven have their soul and spirit, of course, their consciousness, they're there, they're residing in heaven with Christ, awaiting their bodies to be reunited to them only in the resurrected form. The, the church, those that have died before the rapture that are in heaven right now, they will receive their bodies at the rapture. Now, the fifth stage will be the resurrection of the tribulation saints. Look at Revelations 20, verses 4 through 6. Now, let me read Revelation 20, 5 and 6. It says, The rest of the dead did not come to life until the thousand years were ended. But this is the first resurrection. Blessed is the Holy One. Remember, that's, the, the, that's going to be later because uh, it ties to verse 4. But this is the first resurrection. Is Blessed is the Holy is the one who shares in the first resurrection. Over such the second death has no power. But they will be priests of God and of Christ, and they will reign with him for a thousand years. That's the millennium. According to Revelation 20, verse 5, the resurrection of the tribulation saints completes the first resurrection, and it is separated from the completion of the second resurrection by the 1,000 years. We'll, and we'll talk more about that later on, but I want you to, to see that this resurrection takes place. is going to be the Old Testament saints and the tribulation saints. Now, the point of the Revelation 20, verse 6 is that the first resurrection involves believers only, and that is why it's blessed and holy to be a participant in the first resurrection. So we can see that the first resurrection is done in stages with Christ first, and then when that's completed, you will see then the, uh, the resurrection of the, um, the church, and then you're going to see the, uh, as again, I said, the witnesses, the two witnesses, then the resurrection of the Old Testament and the tribulation saints. Now, let's look at some of these groups in more detail than I just gave, so we'll have a better understanding. But I wanted to explain that to you so that you would have a grasp of what we're talking about today. I'll give you more detail. Now, the church saints, they're the ones who are raptured. They're, they're, at that same time, they're resurrected into their new bodies just as Christ was resurrected. Now, when, without warning, millions of people vanish from the earth in the resurrection of the church in the rapture, those left behind will most certainly be shocked and bewildered. 
heavily saturated Christian uh, countries like America and United Kingdom and some other places, they'll likely fall into panic as they grieve the loss of their loved ones and experience their societal functions begin to rapidly falter. You're going to see a big change. And, and what vacuum is going to happen, that's when the Antichrist and, his, and, and these other things are going to start taking place sometime after that. But a supporting verse of the Bible to show the rapture of the church also supports the resurrection of the church of saints, uh, and it's found in 1 Corinthians 15, 52. 1 Corinthians 15, 52 says, In a moment, in the twinkling of an eye, at the last trumpet, for the trumpet will sound, and the dead will be raised imperishable, and we shall be changed. Now, while the Bible doesn't describe in, in detail the glorified bodies that will be changed into, that we will receive to live in for eternity, we know that they will be like that of Jesus' resurrected body. One human, uh, you know, like, like a bodies are described in 1 Corinthians 15, 42 through 53. These, these human bodies, our human bodies, are, are described as perishable, dishonorable, and weak, all due to sin. Our glorified bodies will be imperishable, honorable, and powerful. Our new bodies will no longer be natural bodies subject to decay and death. We will live in victory over sin and death, won by Christ on our behalf. You see that in 1 Corinthians 15, 57. As imperishable bodies, they will no longer suffer from sickness and death, nor will they ever be subject to heat and cold or hunger and thirst. Now, our new bodies will be honorable in that they will not be shamed or shameful because of sin. And just as our earthly bodies are perfect, they're perfectly suited for life on earth, our resurrected bodies will be suited for life in eternity every place that we're at. We will have form and solidity to touch. Uh, Luke 24, 39 through 40, you can see that. We will likely be able to enjoy food, but will be not be driven by it as a necessity or a fleshly desire. See Luke 24, 41 through 43. The resurrected bodies we inherit will be more like what God originally intended rather than what we now abide in. See, God will be the infirmity and the weakness of our sinful flesh. Rather, we will be glorified with Christ and that glory will extend to the bodies that we inhabit. We will no longer be subject to temptation, but will serve God in perfection made perfect by him for all eternity. Okay, let's look at the resurrection of the two witnesses. Remember from our teaching on the tribulation period that the two witnesses really irritate and anger the people who were not saved. They continue to preach about God, witnessing to convert the lost. They perform all kinds of miracles and things that under the power of God. They're hated and people try to kill them, but they in turn are killed. Without doubt, doubt I'm telling you, at the midpoint of the tribulation period, after three and one half days of celebrating the death of the two witnesses at the hand of the Antichrist, the celebrators will be startled to see them resurrect and ascend to heaven in Revelation 11, 7 through 12. <clears throat> and if that's not enough, Revelation 11, 13 says that when they are resurrected and ascend, that at the hour there was a great earthquake. And it says a tenth of the city fell. 7,000 people were killed in the earthquake and the rest of them were terrified and gave God glory up in heaven. See, this is important to understand. The, the resurrection of the saints is a resurrection. At that time, they will receive their glorified bodies. Now, the resurrected saints of the millennium, let's look at this. At the beginning of the millennium, there will be two remarkable resurrections. These will most likely take place during the 75-day interval period and will occur simultaneously. It's believed by many scholars that the Old Testament saints and the tribulation saints will both be raised from the dead in the form of their glorified eternal bodies. Now remember, they will be in, in living in heaven with, with Christ, but not in their bodies until this point in time. Both these groups will be living in heaven with the Lord up to this time, but they will not yet have had their resurrected eternal bodies given to them until the beginning of the millennium. And it's interesting to note that although they most likely won't receive their resurrected bodies until this time period, 
they will be invited guests as friends of the groom, which is Jesus, at the marriage supper of the Lamb just prior to the second coming of Christ. Now, let's look at the identity of the two groups who are resurrected during the 75-day interval. Group one, it's the Old Testament saints. Now, in case of the Old Testament saints, they are the righteous people who died prior to Christ's resurrection. Remember, once Christ led the Old Testament saints that were in paradise, a section of hell, separate, uh, they were separated from God, but they were also separated from the wicked dead who were in torment even to this day. Now in Luke 16, 19 through 31, Jesus talks about the rich man and the poor man Lazarus. Now not to be confused with Jesus' friend Lazarus, the, the brother of Mary and Martha. Uh, specifically, Luke 16, 22 through 26 reads, The poor man died, and the angels took him to the place of honor next to Abraham. The rich man also died and was buried. He went to hell and was suffering terribly. When he looked up and saw Abraham far off and Lazarus at his side, he said to Abraham, Have pity on me. Send Lazarus to dip his finger in water and touch my tongue. I'm suffering terribly in this fire. Abraham answered, my friend, remember that while you lived, you had everything good and Lazarus had everything bad. Now he is happy and you are in pain. And besides, there is a deep ditch, a, a, a gulf here between us that no one from either side can cross over. So let me state here that Jesus was showing that there is no soul sleep. Soul sleep is where people believe that you die and you go into the grave until you're finally resurrected. Well, in other words, they're saying the soul does not sleep. See, this is what's happening here. In the grave until the rapture, the resurrection of the Old Testament saints. They're saying that they go into the grave and until the rapture of the Old Testament saints or the, the resurrection or the, whatever happens here, that they will finally come alive again. But see, this right here proves and shows that Jesus understood and knew that the soul does not sleep. It actually goes to, at that time before his resurrection, it either went to the, the, the horrible part of, of hell, that, that, that place of torment, or they went to paradise, the place that was divided from the unrighteous dead. But rather that the body sleeps, see, here's the thing, and decays and disappears into the earth, uh, in the waters of the oceans, or turns to dust in explosions, See, here's the thing. The body sleeps. It decays. It disappears. And I, as I said, it's the dust of the earth, the waters of the ocean, or it's in, they vaporized in explosions, whatever it is, until their new resurrected body comes back together with a person's spirit. The spirit that, of the Christian are those that are the Old Testament saints, those that believed in God and they were righteous. They're in heaven with Christ today but they won't receive their bodies till later. Now, although the story of the rich man and Lazarus is presented in a parable format, many scholars believe that Jesus was speaking about actual events, which I have no problem in believing because this is really a good depiction of what took place. See, in the New Testament, the most extended depiction of the afterlife is found here in Luke 16, 19 through 31, in that passage. Because there we learn that Shoal has two compartments. Hades proper, where the rich man is sent, Luke 16, 23, and Abraham's bosom, which is also called paradise, where the angels carry Lazarus in Luke 16, 22. Hades proper is a place of torment, where fire causes anguish to the souls imprisoned there. Abraham's bosom, on the other hand, while within shouting distance of Hades, is separated uh, by a great chasm. Look at Luke 16, 26. What brings the question then to us, when Christ died on the cross, where did he go? Now to find out where Jesus' soul went when his body was buried, we go to the Psalms, which has Christ saying to his father in Luke 16, 10, for you will not abandon my soul to Sheol or let my, your Holy One see corruption. See, so we see that Jesus was in a place called Sheol. Now this is not the lake of fire, which is the place of eternal punishment that we will see in Revelation 20, verse 13, which we'll talk about in a later lesson. But Peter quotes this psalm in, when he was preaching on the day of Pentecost in Acts 2, 27. He says, For you will not abandon my soul to Hades, or let your holy ones see corruption. Now you notice the word Hades 
in the place of the word shoal. This occurs because the quote in Acts is in Greek rather than in the original Hebrew. So Hades is the Greek equivalent of Sheol. Now here, Hades is a place where all the dead awaited judgment while the righteous dead waited for the promise separated by that big gulf that Abraham talked about. Christ ascended into hell when he died on the cross. We see in 1 Peter 3.19, says, For Christ also suffered once for sins, the righteous for the unrighteous, and he might bring us to God, being put to death in the flesh, but made alive in the spirit, in which he went and proclaimed to the spirits in prison. Now see, this prison is talking about is hell. Christ didn't preach to the people in hell to bring them into salvation. It was too late. They could have been uh, had salvation if they would have listened to God before that time. But he came to proclaim the truth about his mission and who he is. So following his death for sin, then Jesus journeys to Hades, to the city of death, and he rips his gates off the hinges. He liberates Abraham, Isaac, Jacob, David, John the Baptist, and the rest of the Old Testament faithful, ransoming them from the power of Sheol. You can see that in, in Psalms 49, 15, Psalms 86, 13, and Psalms 89, 48. So see, they had waited there for a very long time not having received what was promised, so that their spirits would be made perfect along with the saints of the new covenant. See that in Hebrews 11, 39 through 40 and Hebrews 12, 23. See, Christ emptied out paradise. So it's no longer a holding place for the righteous dead. And, and here's the thing, what's incredible. Remember, Jesus, when he died on the cross, he told the thief that today I will see you in paradise because he truly believed in Christ and he became saved at that very moment, went down into, uh, into paradise when he died, Jesus met him there. Now, either during the three days of the grave, here's the thing that was taking place, all these things were going on, either at this time or right, see, right after the resurrection, most likely, Jesus ascends to heaven and brings the ransomed dead with him. He takes them out of paradise so that now paradise is no longer down there in the place of torment next to it, but is up in the third heaven, the highest heaven, where God dwells, as you can see in 2 Corinthians 12, verses two through four. So God raised him from the dead, reunited his soul with his now glorified body, so that he is the first fruits of the resurrection harvest. Now, in the church age, when the righteous die, they aren't merely carried by angels to Abraham's bosom, they don't go there anymore, to paradise. They depart to be with Christ, which is far better, as it says in Philippians 1.23. The wicked, however, remain in Hades in torment until the final judgment when Hades gives up the dead who dwell there. They are judged according to their deeds, which will happen at the great white throne judgment, and then death and Hades are thrown into hell, into the lake of fire, we see in Revelations 20, verses 11 through 15. So since the time of Christ and his resurrection, anyone who has accepted Christ as their personal savior and dies, their spirit no longer goes to paradise, as I said, but instead goes to heaven to be with the Lord. 2 Corinthians 5.8 says, We are confident, yes, well pleased, rather to be absent from the body and to be present with the Lord. See, there again, no soul sleep. Immediately, the spirit goes to be with the Lord. See, these Old Testament saints include righteous people in God's sight and all the 12 tribes of Israel, which includes the Jews from the tribe of Judah. And there were also many Gentiles identified in the Old Testament who believed in God and worshiped God as well. Now, I want to show you this. We're, we're looking at, at, I want to talk more about the Old Testament saints. So let's look at some of the Gentiles in, in just a moment. I want to mention this so you understand. As we get into the Old Testament saints, many of them, not only Jews, not only all the rest of the house of Israel, but there were also Gentiles. And these Gentiles, some scholars believe it are, are the Old Testament saints. Think about this in the resurrection. So there will be Gentiles as well. There will most likely be righteous people prior to the flood that makes it in the Old Testament saint resurrection. No one is people. Think about it, his family, uh, they were probably in the resurrection. Now, when I say this, remember, they were not uh, the family of Abraham, which became the Israel, uh, the chosen seed 
of, of God, the chosen family. So these were prior. You would see Noah. You would see Melchizedek. Remember, he believed uh, it's possible that he was a Gentile because uh, he was the king of Salem. You see him in Genesis 14, 18. He would have been one. How about the Egyptians of Exodus chapters 1 through 15, who may have followed after God because of the plagues? Could have happened. They, if there's any of them that did that, they'll be there. Rahab of Joshua chapter 2, the Canaanite prostitute who married uh, the Israelite. Uh, what about Ruth? who was a Moabitess, according to Ruth 1.5, and is listed, this is incredible, listed in the lineage of Jesus in Matthew 1.5. She'll be there. How about the Queen of Sheba? Possibly, you know, 1 Kings 10, verses 1 through 13. She's mentioned in Matthew 12.42. What about the Ninevites at the time of Jonah, who repented and found favor with God? This account is found in Jonah 3, verses 5 through 10, and they're mentioned in Matthew 12, 41. So they would probably be there. A lot of them, if they stayed with God and after they had repented, they may be there as well. And even King Cyrus of Persia, he might be there as well because uh, he might be counted under the resurrection of the old saints, the Old Testament saints. In Ezra 1, 3, it says, King Cyrus publicly declared that the Lord God of Israel, he is God. So we never know who will or will not make it, but I have no doubt that there will be Gentiles that will be included with the Israelites in the Old Testament saints' resurrection. Not just the ones found in the Bible, but many that lived that worshiped and believed in God. So, you know, I, I, I can see those being a part of that Old Testament saints' resurrection because their spirits would be with God now. Now, what about group two, the, the tribulation saints who are resurrected? Now, not only will there be a resurrection of the Old Testament saints, as I just talked about, but as I mentioned, there, there will also be the resurrection of those saints who were killed in the course of the Great Tribulation. This second group, called the Tribulation Saints, are quite simply saints living during the, the Tribulation. Now, remember when I say saints, I'm not talking about someone that has an office. I'm talking about people that are part of the family of God. The tribulation saints will hear the gospel from several possible sources. During this tribulation is when they will be saved. And the first is they'll have the Bible. There'll be probably many, many copies of Bibles left in the world. And when God's judgment begins to fall, many people will likely react by finding the Bible to see if the prophecies are being fulfilled. Many will have heard the gospel of Christ before the rapture, but did not choose Christ at that time and contrary to what some people say, they will be saved after the rapture. They, they'll, they'll come to realize they had heard the, the voice of the Lord, they'd heard preaching and teaching of the word, yet they rejected it at that time. But then their heart knows that, that it was true and will convert to Christ at that time. And see, they'll find themselves in the tribulation and will repent at that time. Many of the tribulation saints will also have heard the gospel from the two witnesses. The Bible says that two individuals who will prophesy, remember these witnesses, for 1,260 days, three and a half years, and perform great miracles. And then there are the 144,000 missionaries from the tribes of Israel who are redeemed and sealed by God during the tribulation, Revelation 7, 1 through 8. Immediately following the description of their sealing in Revelation 7, we read of the multitudes of the tribulation saints are saved from every corner of the world. You can see that in verses 9 through 17. So we know that many people will be saved during the tribulation period. And the tribulation saints will serve their Lord Jesus Christ in the midst of desperate surroundings. Faithful to the end, many of these believers will die for their faith. But in their death, they overcome. They overcome Satan by the blood of the Lamb and by the word of the testimony. They did not love their lives so much as to shrink from death, it says in Revelations 12, 11. So the ones who will be resurrected at the beginning of the millennium will be those who become Christians, both Jews and Gentiles, during the tribulation period and were killed because of their testimony or had died for other reasons. Revelation 7, 9 points out, that there's a great multitude of martyrs during the tribulation period. Which one could, they says, no one could number of all the nations, tribes, peoples, and tongues. 
And the fact that they come from all nations means that they are made up of both Jews and Gentiles. John sees a vast number of these tribulation saints who have been martyred by the Antichrist. This fact that they were killed is brought out by Revelation 20 verse 4, where the Apostle John tells us, Then I saw thrones, and seated on them were those to whom the authority to judge was committed. Also, I saw the souls of those who had been beheaded for the testimony of Jesus and for the word of God, and those who had not worshipped the beast or its image and had not received its mark on their foreheads or their hands. They came to life and reigned with Christ for a thousand years. So in this verse, John sees two collections of saints co-reigning with the Messiah. The first collection of people are to those who judgment was given. The judgment spoken of here relates to the judgment seat of Christ, the Messiah. Those saints will be the church saints who will be resurrected at the rapture and will receive their rewards in the course of the judgment seat of Christ. The second collection of saints, John sees, are identified as those who were beheaded because they did not worship the Antichrist or his image. And they will not be willing to consent to receiving the mark of the beast. So obviously then, these cannot be anyone but the tribulation saints. And they too will be resurrected at this, at this time during the 75-day interval period prior to the beginning of the millennium. Now what's amazing is that for those returning Jews and the rest of the house of Israel who were persecuted during the persecution campaign of the Antichrist and they live and last out the tribulation. So many of them may still be mourning uh, and the loss of their loved ones that got killed by the Antichrist. Imagine this, that when they discover that their loved ones, if they were believers in Christ, are also resurrected at the time of the tribulation saints are resurrected, and will be reigning with the Messiah, Jesus Christ, in Israel. I mean, what a marvelous homecoming this is going to be, because you see you had a relative that just in the last several years had been killed by the Antichrist, and all of a sudden you see them again, and they're ruling with Christ. It's, it's incredible. And so see, the resurrection of the tribulation saints will rule with Christ. The tribulation saints that made it out of the tribulation alive, now those, they'll be the ones who live during the millennium in their earthly bodies. So Daniel informs us that whoever survives these additional 75 days will be blessed. This is because those who somehow manage to live through the 75 year tribulation, or the seven, excuse me, 70 uh, year tribulation period, let me say that again, those that somehow manage to live through the seven year tribulation period, and the 75 day interval will enter into the millennium and populate the nations. Some people will be allowed to live in the 1000 year messianic kingdom of the millennium, but others won't. And as you can see, this will be a very busy time for Jesus as he sets up his kingdom. He'll bring judgment upon the wicked who survived the tribulation. He'll cleanse or rebuild the temple in Jerusalem. He'll resurrect the Old Testament and tribulation saints, and he'll restore the earth to in anticipation of his kingdom. So the resurrected saints and the rapture of the, the church, those are the, which is also the bride of Christ, as we know, will rule and reign with Christ, Jesus our King. Now, it, in our next couple of lessons, of course, we're going to be going on, and we're going to look at the millennium itself and what takes place during that time. So for now, let's pray. Dear Heavenly Father, we just thank you for this opportunity for us to be able to come to you and to be able to worship you, to be able to listen to the word and to be able to study. I ask right now that you will guide us and direct us in all that we do, that you'll open up our minds and our spirits to your word so that we will have a spirit of understanding and that you'll give us a definition to what we are learning so that we can speak about it to others so they too uh, could be saved. I ask right now that you'd watch over each one of us, bless us, help us to be students of the word, and we thank you for it. In your precious holy name we pray, Lord Jesus. Amen. Well, thank you for joining in with me today for this message. To find out more about Center Points Christian Fellowship, visit our website at www.centerpoints.org. On our website and in the narrative on YouTube and Facebook, you can find a link to our YouTube channel with all our video messages recorded so far, including this one. 
You can also sign up for our weekly newsletter updates and my blog and find out how to join us on our Wednesday night Bible study and our women's uh, Thursday morning Bible study by sending an email requesting it at info at centerpoints.org. So until I see you again, stay safe and may God bless you and have a great day.